Kingdom of Nye, from west of the Rockies, dial 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies, 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at 1-775-727-1222. Or use the wild card line at 1-775-727-1295. To reach Art on the toll-free international line, call your AT&T operator and have them dial 800-893-0903. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell on the Premier Radio Networks. Well, all right. Coming up in a moment, Rob Riggs. You know, I note here, though, uh, from people who are fast blasting me, uh, Rochester was on here bragging about their snow mountain. Uh, I'm being told here by people in the New York area that Buffalo is... A trucker flashes me here that Buffalo is trucking snow to Rochester for their snow mountain. <laughs> they certainly have snow to spare, right? But they're they're trucking the snow all the way to Rochester for the mountain. Is that really true? <laughs> all right. Coming up in a moment, Rob Riggs, who is a journalist and uh, the former publisher of a series of award-winning community uh, newspapers down in Texas. His interest is in ghost lights, wild man sightings, and related phenomena. It all began when he was a child. Of course it did. When he heard tales about all of these things in his hometown of Sour Lake in Big Thicket Country, Riggs began writing about the subject more than 20 years ago while working as a reporter for the Kunst News. Since then, his studies of the phenomena have been featured in the Houston Chronicle and the Beaumont Enterprise. Riggs has also consulted on ghost lights for Waseda University in Tokyo and Harvard College Observatory. So all of that immediately ahead. Okay, here in the nighttime is Mr. Riggs, Rob Riggs. Rob, how are you? Good morning, Art. Good morning, I'm Rob. Fine. Where are you? I'm in Austin, Texas. Down, oh, down in Austin. Yes, sir. All right. Um, we have an affiliate here that carries your show. That, that's right. Um, uh, that's exactly right. Uh, and which one is that? KLBJ AM. Uh -huh. KLBJ, LBJ. Mm -hmm. uh, that means something. LBJ. Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, darn right. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, the thicket. What do you mean by thicket? What is thicket? Is that just a high weed country or? What? <laughs> no, there is a a region. Uh, uh, what a lot of people around the country don't realize is that the eastern, about the eastern quarter of Texas is heavily forested. It is the uh, western extent of the southern mixed forest. Oh, there's no question about it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, eastern Texas in general is green and uh, uh, pretty lush. It's, uh, you know, everybody's, uh, you know, they, they think of Texas as sort of a uh, semi-arid, the desert. And, and, <laughs> right. and a lot of Texas is like that, yes. but, but not the eastern part. It's a whole different area. That's yes, right. it's, it's, uh, it's basically like Louisiana, Mississippi, and the deep south. Sure. Uh, as as a matter of fact, the the forested areas of East Texas are roughly equivalent to the forested areas of the of, in, of the entire New England states. That's a lot of forest. Yeah. So so just to give people an idea of the scale, uh, I know when a lot of, when some people hear that there's a Bigfoot in the, uh, in Texas, they immediately think, well, how could there be a Bigfoot in Texas? Well, because you know we have a lot of suitable habitat. Now, obviously, I mean, if Bigfoot is real. Right. Then he's going to require the kind of area that you're talking about to be able to evade death or capture. Correct. Now, the big thicket is uh, what is a name that has traditionally been given to the southern end of the East Texas Piney Woods. Okay. 
this is roughly between uh, the Trinity River, uh, the lower Trinity River, which is just east of Houston, uh, about to the Louisiana border. Hmm. And it's uh, the, the region is about 60, 70 miles wide and about the, about the same distance uh, north to south. And it encompasses the two biggest river swamp systems in, in East Texas, and uh, many know, bayous, marshes. I, I, I want to stop you uh, yes. for just one moment. Yes. Uh, have you been a listener to the show for a while? Yes. Do you remember a man who claimed that he killed two Bigfoot? I heard that story, but I heard that was up in the panhandle of Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh, which is more like the country you were referring to, the other kind of country of part That's of That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I won't say that there have never been any uh, sightings of Bigfoot in Texas outside of East Texas. Occasionally, you know, there uh, there have been some. And matter matter of fact, uh, I know of two organizations uh, in Texas that that chart recent sightings, uh, both of which have websites. And one of them actually reported a sighting in uh, Lago Vista, which is on Lake Travis right outside of Austin in the hill country. Mm. There, are, there is some land out there that's fairly undeveloped, owned by the local river authority. So you, you have approached this whole thing as a journalist? Yes, sir. The way, the way I got st uh, started on this art is that I grew up in a little town called Sour Lake, which is uh, population 1,600. Uh, right on the southern edge of the Big Thicket, right on, uh, there is a national park in the Big Thicket. Actually, it's a preserve administered by the Park Service. Right. And uh, Sour Lake is within about three miles of the uh, the uh, boundary of the park. And uh, I grew up hearing the stories from the time I was about ten years old. Uh, uh, I remember stories about a naked, hairy, wild man mm -hmm. having been seen in Hardin County. It was reported in the newspaper, uh, the Coons News, which I ultimately grew up to have my first newspaper job working for that, that actual paper. Hmm. I remember the articles, and uh, when I wrote the book, I went back and researched and, and got the articles, and they, they were uh, in 1952, which incidentally is about six years before the Bigfoot stories became popularized in California. Nobody ever heard the term Bigfoot uh, that far back. So what what they in in the newspaper stories and even now you referred to this as a wild man. Well, it is uh, it has been referred to as a as a uh, hairy naked wild man. Uh, people didn't know what to call it, and you'll find it's, now this is kind of interesting in in the Pacific Northwest. You have a long history of sightings going back to you know the Native Americans, and they basically have come to be known as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. That's right. Well, in the in the deep south, and what what uh, many people aren't aware of is that there is an equally long tradition of sightings of large, hairy, humanoid creatures throughout the deep south, from East Texas up into Arkansas and Well, okay, let me, let me ask you this. Yes. Um, we know the traditional look of Bigfoot and how it's described uh -huh. by the Patterson film and by a lot of other things. People have seen it on TV right. or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So they know what that looks like. Now, Wild Man, that almost sounds like it could be a description of a feral human being. Well, that's, that's one of the intriguing parts of the story, Art, is that... Sometimes the descriptions do seem more like that, but the descriptions have also uh, the the uh, I've interviewed about a dozen eyewitnesses of the big thicket wild men. I've talked to people. Well, for example, on radio shows. Okay, good. How then? How hairy? I mean, they, I've seen Bigfoot, and it's really hairy, like mm -hmm. animal hair. Right. Uh, now, wild man is apparently sometimes described as just really hairy, and there are really hairy humans, and there are right. really feral humans. Right. People don't know about that. They don't believe it, but there are feral humans, uh, wild humans, like wild animals. Well, that, that's one possibility of what we may be dealing with here. But the, uh, it, uh, I, there, to tell you the truth, there are two categories of sightings that I, that I have run across in the Big Thicket. One is, is like a typical Bigfoot. It is described as an ape-like creature covered with hair. Okay. 
There is another description, which is more like what you're talking about. People have described it as being appearing like a primitive-looking Indian. Now, th I'll tell you something. The, there, was a tr there was a tribe of Indians that lived on the Texas Gulf Coast from about Corpus Christi, which is around about the Middle Coast, up to about uh, the, uh, the Galveston Island. That was called the Karankawas. They were, uh, anthropologists consider them to have been probably the, the most primitive Indians that lived in the United States. Some mm -hmm. people think that they may actually have been a primitive form of man, that they may not have been Homo sapiens sapiens. Their average height of the male warriors was reputed to have been over seven feet tall. Mm. Mm -hmm. They are said to have grown long hair down past their waist and but to they, have worn but, animal pelts. Okay, wait, but that's, yes. you know, that's not really typical, is it, of early humans? In other words, uh, even as we can look at sort of macro evolution for humans, we mm -hmm. seem to be getting taller. But uh, if, if you go back, you would think it would, we would be smaller if it was a direct relation to us. Well, that's what I say. It may not have been a Homo sapiens sapiens. And, you know, there, there are stories. And, uh, I, you know, I don't have any proof of this, but I have heard stories of um, Bronze Age mounds in, in the United States that have been excavated where they found skeletons of gigantic human beings. And some people think that these may have actually been, you know, you always hear the story, well, if Bigfoot is real, why haven't we ever found any of their bones? Right. Some people think, well, that may that may be it. That might be, but you know, as you know, many times when any information like that surfaces, it is it is it is suppressed because it doesn't fit the uh, the, the dominant paradigm of how things are assumed to have been. Well, that's right. And yeah. in fact, actually, a lot of the bones that have been uh, discovered have been hidden away because there is no reasonable way to explain them. Exactly. Uh, they end up in the basements of museums. That's and correct. Forgotten. Uh, people right. don't believe it, but that's really true. That is exactly what happens to them. Right. Instead of considering uh, that we have an important find here that may be a link, uh, they don't want to think about that, so they just they put it up on the shelf. Pretty crazy, huh? Yep. Well, now, what I was going to say about these Karankawas is that uh, in many... Now, you, if you can imagine a, a, a male warrior, Karankawa, seven feet tall. He's got black hair down past his waist. He's wearing animal skins. And they were known to have covered their bodies with mud to keep off and, and, and uh, alligator or shark oil to keep off the mosquitoes in the marshes. Uh -huh. If you can imagine that you're in the woods in dim light and shadow and you were to come across one of those, it would look like he was covered with hair. Well, it could look like it. Now, I have had sightings in the big thicket of people describing... That would be if I recovered from my heart attack. <laughs> Believe me. Yes. Uh, I, have had, I have had people uh, in a particular area near, near the mouth of the Trinity River and the Trinity Swamps. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been a number... I've had several independent reports of people seeing what they described, what, looked, what sounds like Karakawa Indians. Now, there have even been some investigators. I believe it was, uh, well, John Green, you know, some of the early Bigfoot investigators, mm -hmm. uh, who have suggested that the Karankawas may have actually have migrated to the Pacific Northwest, and that what we're seeing is and thinking our Bigfoot may actually be survivors of the Karankawa tribe. Well, whatever. You know, yeah. why? Why is it not? reasonable to assume that there could be some peoples out there, some uh, creatures or humans or whatever they are, that simply have decided they do not wish to share in our uh, modern lifestyle, period. They don't want anything to do with uh, this civilization. It's not the way they live, nor is it the way they want to live, mm -hmm. and so they don't. They well, say, as a matter of fact, Art, I reached that conclusion in my book. Really? Yes. That, and I, I think that that may well be the case. And I think that these people, and I, and I do think we're dealing with people, 
uh, even whether they're whether they're a primitive form of human being or something in between a human being and an ape, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think that they have abilities to evade our detection that are off the scale in terms of weirdness. And, and this is based on... Well, how, how far off scale? Uh, so far off scale as to uh, to us to seem uh, like magic or paranormal? or Yes, whatever. yes. Ah. Uh-huh. And this is, what, this is what my research in East Texas and Louisiana has indicated to me. And, and it's interesting because it, it overlaps, and say in the case of Louisiana, it overlaps with the voodoo practice among the Cajuns and the Creoles. And, at, and in Mississippi, uh, it overlaps. Uh, I got an email today from a Choctaw Indian who talked about, he looked at my website and looked at the things I was writing about, mm -hmm. and he talked about how this was part of the shamanic practices of their witch doctors, and they knew about these things, dating back to antiquity. And you'll find, uh, if you study the the folklore of the American Indians in the Pacific Northwest and in the Deep South. And they say that these creatures are an ancient form of human being that does, in fact, avoid contact with civilization. Well, that could be a logical thing for somebody to do, to say, don't want a damn thing to do with it. Here's the way we live. Not only that, but because they're so separate and reject all that is uh, that we are, mm -hmm. then they would develop their own everything, really. And, and they might develop uh, in an entirely different way with uh, different uh, talents and abilities and senses. Yes, and you know, there's the theory about the uh, the two side the two sides of the brain. Oh yes. And we, uh, uh, modern Western society, has developed the rational side of the brain. And our whole worldview and the whole way we look at reality, the way we look at nature, the way we look at everything is based on that. Even time. Yes. E everything, yes. Yes, I was hearing what you were talking about, time. Well, imagine if you had a, a, a human being that developed the intuitive side of the brain to the nth degree. Which is probably exactly what you would do if you were not caught up in the... Uh, Culture. If you were a feral, wild human being. Ab absolutely. The, yes. the intuitive side would, would be raging in you right. in all probability. Yeah, I can imagine that, sure. There are... If you go... If you, if, if, you know, there aren't many of them left. But if you go to some of the so-called primitive traditional shamanic cultures on the and you know in the third world where there is any surviving that actually have a maintain a shamanic traditions yes sir uh, their worldview is entirely alien to what we think of as real mm -hmm. uh, they they have contact with what they call the spirit world uh, they have they have incredible there is evidence of incredible uh, psychic and paranormal uh, abilities in that we've lost. It's, it's like it's like part of our brain is atrophied because of the way our culture has developed, the way we've evolved. We've we've uh, it's atrophied, and then these feral people, or these wild people, who are not even to the level of what would be the shamanic traditional cultures. It's like the exact opposite. All right, hold it right there. We're at the bottom of the hour. He's I'm sure he's absolutely right about that capability. I'm Art Bell. Good morning. I've been drifting on the sea of heartbreak Trying to get myself ashore for so long For so long Listening to the stranger stories
Kingdom of Nye from west of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies, 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at 1-775-727-1222. And the wild card line is open at 1-775-727-1295. To reach Art on the toll-free international line, call your AT&T operator and have them dial 800-893-0903. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell from the Kingdom of Nye. It certainly is, and I just got a very interesting fast blast. <laughs> this is interesting. I'm not going to give the name of the person who sent it from Bangor, uh, Maine. But it says, Art, when I was a kid in Boston, and obviously uh, he's older now, right? I, I met a man who represented himself as you, meaning me, Art Bell. Was it you or an imposter? Now get this, folks. If it was you, I told you all about time travel and about the future. If it was or wasn't you, let me know. <laughs> this person might want to send me an email for any uh, further communication. Back now into the thicket with Rob Briggs, who wrote a book uh, that you can find out about on my website and, of course, Amazon.com and so forth and so on. It's called uh, In the Big Thicket on the Trail of the Wild Man. Here's Rob again. Um, okay, Rob, uh, question for you, if you don't mind. Um, okay. With regard to either one of these um, classes, you know, the wild man or uh, Sasquatch or Bigfoot, whatever you want to call it, what are the... Uh, what are the, the reports that you consider uh, perhaps credible involving what they can do that to us seems paranormal? Well, the uh, James Swan, uh, who is a professor at um, Cal State Davis, did a study in the Pacific Northwest about 12 years ago, and uh, he noted that a typical Bigfoot sighting involved a uh, a feeling of uh, of uh, charged energy in the atmosphere, uh, and then you would hear typically you would hear a howling sound. Uh, sometimes you would smell a, a musky odor. Then people would see uh, frequently would would see uh, the uh, wild uh, man or the Sasquatch or the Bigfoot uh, in a uh, a range of usually a few miles over a period of a few days, uh, and then it would simply vanish. And many times there have been uh, uh, search parties put together and 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 posses going out with bloodhounds and so on. Yeah, people and still they have, failed, they have failed to uh, find, find them. Yeah, yes. A lot of people don't know that that's true, that uh -huh. uh, these stories uh, have been sort of more than just stories, so much so that, that yeah, posses have been formed, mm -hmm. people have gone out uh, in mass looking for these things, and they are just gone. Right. Now, this is why, Art, you know, there's, there's two basic schools uh, in regard to... Uh, of uh, the, to the Bigfoot phenomenon, and that is what they call the flesh and blood and the paranormal. Right. This is why I can't buy into merely the flesh and blood. 
uh, that because there's there's too much history of these things just disappearing, mm-hmm. and there is some testimony of people saying of literally seeing them vanish before their very eyes. Mm-hmm. And uh, now, how many how many reports like that are there? Though that's pretty impressive. Well, I uh, I don't have any uh, from the big thicket. But if you su- if you study the literature, and there there are a number of people. Uh, in fact, uh, I have drawn on the research of a number of well-known writers, uh, John Keel, Lauren Coleman, sure, uh, who, who are people that I correspond with. Sure, I know Lauren. Yeah, and uh, Paul Devereaux and uh, David Clark and the boards from England, uh, and Dr. Michael Persinger from Canada. And these are all people that I've either studied and or corresponded with, and and have gotten to be friends with. There's a substantial uh, body of evidence in this regard. Uh, and this has led some people, like uh, Dr. Persinger, to basically dismiss the things as hallucinatory. Huh. Uh, I, don't, I can't dismiss them as hallucinatory because there's too much physical evidence. Uh, that is, you know, footprints. Uh, there have been uh, re- uh, recorded uh, footprints of the Big Thicket Wild Man and Bigfoot, you know, all over. Uh, the, and there are some, so apparently there are some hair samples, you know, and this phenomenon, by the way, is international. Uh, I'm corresponding with a wildlife uh, biologist from uh, from Russia. There's a, there's a long tradition of, uh, and they actually call it wild men there too, and in China. Now, in ch- the remote help, area. help me out here. Um, yes. They, they have retrieved hair, yes. and I have heard that in a number of tests, it simply comes back no known Mammal, right? Is that, I've is heard that, that of those, is those results coming back no. as primate, but unknown. Uh, unknown unknown primate. primate, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. But the point is, uh, Dr. Swan interviewed a couple of um, uh, American Indian, Native American uh, shaman in, uh, in his part of his investigation, and they told him simply that, well, the reason that you can't find these beings is because they live in two worlds. They can manifest in this world, and they can leave this world. Well, maybe they live in two dimensions. Right. Well, I would say that would be uh, that would be living in two worlds. Uh, oh yeah. It would be what what an American Indian might call what we would say living in two dimensions. Yes. Now another another thing they said is that these we uh, we have to almost reduce everything to science to uh, begin to even get a grasp on it. People are right. just now understanding. Uh, there may well be more dimensions up to 11. Uh, they're just beginning to, I think, grasp that. So then the, the, the possibility that a creature like this would live in an adjacent uh, right. a dimension is uh, fairly probable. Uh, I think so, and, and we're getting, uh, I'm getting to why I, why I think it's highly likely. But uh, the, the Indians also said that they believed that these creatures had the power to make themselves invisible to a human observer. And uh, John Green, and you can go back and check uh, the, uh, the, the, some of the original Bigfoot research that came out in the 60s uh, and some of the classic Bigfoot books, and a number of the different research teams reported being in Bigfoot country, actually hearing them, and in some cases, actually, actually hearing them walking around in their vicinity and not, able, not, not being able to see them. See, now, to me, that would be different than being in another dimension. Uh, if it was just invisibility or somebody right. winking out, you could think they're going to another dimension. Obviously, to us, right. they are suddenly invisible. But you're suggesting... Well, they may have both. You're suggesting... Or, yeah, you seem to yeah. be suggesting invisibility in this dimension and and the the ground shakes and the twigs break and right. and they make footprints but right. there's nothing to see but they may also be able to do i mean that may be like an intermediary you see but, but between being in this space time frame and going to another one mm. because what they may be dealing with is elements of 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 perception and ambient energy fields involved with perception that we're basically ignorant of. And this is something our, you know, our neuroscientists are just beginning to understand about how how parts of the brain work in terms of how we organize uh, ex- the, the uh, perception. 
mm-hmm. the perception of an external objective reality in the you know the temporal lobe and so on. This is what Dr. Persinger has done, and, uh, uh, some you know admirable work in terms of uh, how the temporal lobes work in regard to organizing our perception of external reality. And his theory is that something interferes with that process and usually he, uh, he postulates that it's these unusual energies you know like I say and Swan says that uh, the first thing that will happen is there will be a sense of an, un- an unusually uh, strong energy field in an area well, before the wild man shows up we we see in a certain spectrum yes exactly right? uh, we see in a certain spectrum and uh, I think it has something may have something to do with vibrational levels and if something begins vibrating at a frequency that takes it to a level beyond uh, our vision's capability to us it would become invisible right exactly and 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 by and and the reverse would also be true like if you were if you were suddenly subjected to an energy field that, and your mind and your mind became entrained to an energy field that raised the vibrations you might then be able to see something that you would not normally be able to see. <laughs> That's right. Right. That's exactly right. All right, now, uh, there are other reports. There are reports in the thicket of something called a ghost light. Right. Now, that's interesting. Uh, when you, uh, What is a ghost light, please? Okay, there are about... Uh, now, all the people that I have uh, mentioned to you before, these other researchers, uh, particularly... Uh, uh, Paul Devereaux and David Clark and, and from the UK have uh, written about what are in the English speaking world are normally called ghost lights or mystery lights and these are typically spherical lights uh, usually about the size of a basketball usually of an intense uh, bluish white uh, uh, you know luminosity mm-hmm. that tend to occur and recur in the same areas over long periods of time. They call it the standing ghost light phenomenon. Hmm. And they tend to be highly localized or to occur within uh, an area, say, a a few miles. Now, uh, Michael Persinger and, and Lauren Coleman and a number of others have documented about 40 locations in North America where there are long-standing standing ghost light uh, locations. All right. Uh, uh, and and there are a number of them also are in the in U in the UK and there are they're all around the world. Okay. Uh let me lay something on you. Okay. okay? Let's see if this uh, makes any sense to you. Okay. Uh there have been some new discoveries in physics. Uh, I listened to a physicist uh, interviewed by Whitley Strieber on Dreamland who has measured what are called plasma balls mm-hmm. uh, that are very much like these balls of light you're talking about. And that wouldn't be old Professor Otsuki, would it? Uh, I believe it is, yes. Yeah, I, and, yeah I've met Professor Otsuki. Well, at any rate, uh, he has demonstrated scientifically mm-hmm. that these plasma balls are able to either to keep their energy static or actually increase it. Now, if you think that, you know, and that's just pos- impossible from a physics point right. of view. Uh, unless from a thermodynamic or electrodynamics theory, it right. Just, it just can't be. If it's some exactly. freak of nature that created this plasma ball, one could understand that perhaps, but it would obviously lessen quickly in intensity, you know, and burn right. out in the atmosphere. But mm-hmm. this is what they, honest to God, they're discovering that these things maintain or increase uh, the right. amount of energy they use to continue to be this ball, this plasma ball, it's the damnedest thing. Well, you're exactly right. Now, Art, people have been seeing the, these ghost lights in the big thicket since at least the turn of the century. In the 1960s, an old newspaper editor down there in, in Coons started writing about it, and he called on scientists in the area to come out and study the phenomenon and try to explain it. Mm-hmm. Well, they came out and rather... Uh, you know, rather lamely tried to pass it off as swamp gas. Swamp gas. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> now, to this date, Art, as far as I know, there has never been any serious study of the 
the Big Thicket Go Slide by any American team of physicists. But in 1989, I participated in a research on Bragg Road with Professor Otsuki of Waseda University, Japan. Oh, no kidding. Yes. And he concluded that there were plasma balls on Bragg Road. He also said, interestingly enough, now there there is another ghost light location in West Texas called the Marfa Lights. Oh, yes. Quite famous. Sure. He told me that in his experience, there were more sightings of what he called ball lightning or plasma balls in Texas than anywhere in the world. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh -huh. Between the, the ghost light in West Texas and the ghost light in... All right, you can go to any virtually any town between Houston and Beaumont and a lot of people even in the big cities who have either heard of or actually seen these ghost lights. Can you, before we return to that, can you help me out with something that I really do need help with? Uh, all my life I've heard everything in the world dismissed as swamp, swamp, gas. swamp gas. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I, do, you I, live, I, do you live near the swamps? <laughs> the big thicket is in the swamps. It's in the swamps. Okay, so then what is swamp gas and what is it capable of doing? Well, do you know Patrick Weege? No. Well, he wrote a book called Swamp Gas Times about uh, his studies of uh, UFOs. And my, my response to that is, you know, if all the – and I've been interviewing people and studying these phenomena for 20 years, and I don't know of anybody who's ever seen swamp gas. What? <laughs> are, are you serious? Yeah. I have never seen a photograph of swamp gas. Well, I actually, I, I, I haven't either. I haven't either. I'm not sure it actually exists. I think it's a government conspiracy. <laughs> well, so there's never been a case of, like, a story in a local paper there, oh, my God, swamp gas situation bad last night. No. Uh, local uh, citizens observe strange swamp gas well, lights. You know, or... the, 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 uh, you know, you're talking about how these ghost lights cannot be ex explained. Uh, Right. Uh, and, and electrodynamic theory. Well, you know, people trot out theories about earthquake lights and so on and so on and, oh, yeah. try to, and ball lightning and try to explain them, but those are all discharge phenomena that are very short-lived. Well, besides, it would behave as it should behave. If it was right. lightning or something like that, you've got an initial charge. Yeah, it's their it, discharge It phenomena. creates this whatever it is, and then it dissipates or even explodes, and ball lightning does that. Right. But and the same things... with the swamp gas. Those are very those. And from what I can tell, swamp gas is actually a very rare phenomenon. But, but neither one of us uh, have any evidence of uh, of swamp gas existing. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's right. And it, yet it has been used to explain. Yes. And, uh, that, it, uh, think of the oddity of that. Something that it's, itself has never been, been realized as, as real is used to explain other right. stuff that they can't figure out. Exactly. And by the way, Art, <laughs> while, we're, while we're talking, I would like to invite your listeners to go to my website, which is uh, mysteriousdimension.com. Wait a minute. Let me see if we have... Uh, I would bet that on my website right now we would have your website. Yes. Uh, oh, and, and we do. Go... Here, here it is, mysteriousdimension.com. You go to my website, folks. Right. Go to tonight's... Click on to introduction. Yep. And uh, at the top, there will be a slideshow that, that gives you some pictures of the big ticket. And the first one is a picture of the ghost road. Now, this road is where the big ticket ghost light appears. Wait a minute. I'm on your website. Yeah. All right. Uh... Go to introduction. Uh, if I go to intro at the bottom of the page, I, I did intro at the top, and oh, okay, here I am. I'm there. Do you see the? Uh, do you see the uh, road with the? Oh, yeah. this is pretty cool. That, this is what they call the ghost road. This is where the this is where the ghost light appears in the big thicket. This is pretty cool. Yeah, the, especially the way it's presented here. The uh, pictures peel uh -huh. peel away from each other in three right. dimensions. Oh, somebody did some really good work. Yeah. Yeah, the, the man named Ira Kennedy from San Marcos, Texas, designed this for me. He's a, he's a, he's a real pro. Oh, this is now, really cool. Now, now, Art, the first picture is a picture of the ghost road where the light occurs. And then there are some big thicket scenes. Now, if you go down, scroll down, Can I you'll, stop? See a, you'll see a picture that looks like fog. Oh, yeah, I'm there. You see that? Yep. That is a photograph 
of one phase of manifestation of the big thicket ghost light. Wow! It actually has it actually has different phases that it that it can you know that it can appear. Who ways who look. caught these photographs as it manifested like this? Wow! My friend and uh, Bill Fleming and I, who is my associate research, done a lot of research down there with me, and I took this photograph. Now listen to this. This is this is really interesting. We went to the ghost to the ghost road and drove about halfway down the length. And in the distance, we in the distance we thought we saw a light cross the road and go off in into the woods. So we drove up to about where we thought that was, and we set up. And we had talked to a man from Joplin, Missouri, who had done some photographic studies. Hold of, your story. Of, hold uh, your no. Hold your story right there. Yeah. It'll be a cliffhanger uh, during okay. during the break. That's how we get people to stick around. You know? <laughs> well, these pictures are awesome. You've got to see what he's got. Go to my website. Go to uh, tonight's guest info and click on his website. This is absolutely excellent stuff. Really good photographs. My, my, my. Uh, it's the MysteriousDimension.com website, and the link is right there on my website. So go take a look. It's well worth a look. <laughs> I'm Art Bell. Kingdom of Nye, from west of the Rockies, dial 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies, 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at 1-775-727-1222. Or use the wild card line at 1-775-727-1295. To reach Art on the toll-free international line, call your AT&T operator and have them dial 800-893-0903. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell on the Premier Radio Networks. From the high desert, that's who we are. We'll be right back. Well, all right, uh, once again, Rob Riggs, we were uh, talking about plasma balls and uh, the lights and looking at your website. Uh, you know what? I'm afraid. Uh, I'm sorry about this, uh, but I'm being told by people on Fast Blast that your website is blown up. It's blown up? Yeah, it's blown up. Uh, too many people hitting it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's too bad. Yeah. Uh, I would still urge people to try this. It's pretty awesome. I mean, the photograph of the forming light. In the formation stage is really neat. That is some photograph. That's what we call the luminous mist or luminous fog stage. And the, the way people who see that uh, describe it uh, in the distance, it's like a small fog bank with a bright spot in it. And you can see at the top of the photograph where it's brighter. You absolutely can, yes. Yeah. Now, listen to this, Art. 
When we took that photograph, we did not see that light. What? Really? Right. We were uh, told by a gentleman who was uh, who was uh, uh, researching the uh, the um, ghost light in Joppa, Missouri, which I think they call the Ozark Spook Light. Now, the, that if the, you would go to a place where the ghost lights manifest, you could take photographs, and that sometimes the energy that that manifest the lights would be there just outside the visible range light range <laughs> is the photograph to the right of it of the same area yes, that's that is the test photograph the photograph to the right was taken with a flash the photograph to the left that showed the fog was taken without a flash that's awesome uh, these are clear folks uh, so you know what you're going after if you can get on the website these are clear, probably were uh, 35 millimeter. Right, 35 program. millimeter with the yeah. thousand speed. Yeah, count. very, very clear, very clear. So, uh, quite convincing. Ooh, this is cool. Now, Art, uh, that 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 phase can also be visible, though. We we got it right outside the visible light range, but it can also be visible. Now, I have also had people testify that they had seen the fog collapse into the bright spot and form the sphere. And that's when it becomes visible to the yes, human that, eye? Yes, that's when it becomes the basketball-sized sphere. Yep. Now, I have talked to people who have seen that thing for five minutes, who, who have had, a, had, the, had the light chase them up and down the road chase at speeds them. of 50, 60 miles an hour. Really? Yes. And there's no there's no light there's no light known to any uh, thermodynamics or electrodynamics that would act like that. You use the word chase. Yes, chase. Now, do you really mean that in the in the literal sense of the word? Because that that implies inte inte intelligent action. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I interviewed a man in Beaumont when I was teaching school there. And word got out that I was, this is when I first started researching the book. Uh -huh. This man came to me, his name was Jim. And he said, Mr. Ricks, he says, uh, I'm going to tell you about what happened to me on uh, Bragg Road. And it's been 30 years since I saw this thing, and I have never told anyone before, and I have never been back to that place. Uh -huh. He saw the light. He went out there when he was a teenager, a bunch of kids. The light comes up, approaches them uh, from the, the front of their vehicle, gets right over their car, into their car, and stalls the engine. Oh, that, that would indicate electromagnetic. Right. It has an electromagnetic parameter. But they said uh, that these kids were terrified because they said the thing was like it was alive. Well, maybe. Now, I have since uh, interviewed a number of witnesses who have had similar experiences with the thing knocking out their... Uh, their electrical systems on their cars, and this is typical of ghost lights around the country. Well, maybe it was alive. Yeah. Now, here's the thing, though. Uh, in many ghost light locations, people uh, uh, people make that observation that the lights seem to be alive, yes. to play with them, to be inquisitive, to be conscious of their presence. Now, so those are. Uh, now, I have. I, I do not have a photograph of the basketball size, you know, phase of the manifestation. I do have a, a photograph of another phase, which is called the firefly phase. Okay. The firefly phase, generally, the, it, it is a smaller light, not as big as the basketball size. It looks like a large firefly, and they appear in the treetops. They're also called pinpoint lights. And uh, typically, it, it would just be one light. And uh, we were out there one night, and the light appeared above our heads. This wouldn't be where George Bush stole that phrase, would it? What phrase? A thousand points. Of light. <laughs> I don't know. Uh. But uh, the, the point is, the light can manifest in different ways, or at least, or you could say this: then there, there may be phases of the same uh, manifestation of the same, you know, phenomenon, or they could be different phenomena. They could be different things, all of which are luminous. Now, here's an interesting thing about Bragg Road. Bragg Road is almost perfectly straight. It's about eight miles long, it's and it's got, almost exactly uh, oriented to north and south. It almost has a uh, total thicket cover, too. I mean, yes, it, yeah, it, it does. It, you know, if there were no lights, no creatures, nothing, 
at night, it would be one freaky, scary road to go the down. Big Thicket is a scary place. Or, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. That's, that's and, and it has been known as such for ever since you know it's been settled by you know. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is archaeological evidence that the Indians never settled the heart of the Big Thicket where the lights appear. That they avoided it. Really? And the, yes, and the tradition is that they said that that part of the woods was haunted by demons and they wouldn't go there. There is no evidence of any permanent uh, Indian uh, culture having existed in that part of Hardin County. And where the they used the word demons? That's, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, no, they didn't. I mean, I'm, they had their own word for that. Right, but but am word. amounted to demons. Yes. <laughs> and and traditionally, there are places around the country where uh, this is the case, where the howling, hairy creatures appear, where the weird lights appear. And so the point is that there, there there's a correlation between the appearance of these lights, Art, and the appearance of the wild man. I, I, I really was not fully conscious of that association until I started writing stories about the ghost lights. Have you have you ever heard uh, or seen one of these creatures? Yeah, uh, I have heard it, yes. You've uh, heard and, it. and I have interviewed about about 15 or 20 people who have actually seen it and or heard it. Uh, in you, 1988... You, yeah, excuse me, but you've personally heard it? Yes. All right, um, one moment, please. Okay. Uh, does it in any way sound like this? Now, that's one recording that I have. And, and if I were to categorize that, I'd say we're listening to a wild man. It sounds like a wild man to me. Well, Lord, let me tell you what, what happened to me. I... I had deduced, after having studied it for some time, that that there was an area where I could go and I might have a chance of intercepting a, a sort of a travel route that they might use. Yes. I went out to uh, in the deep woods, uh, and it was a, a pipeline right away that cut through the woods. Right. And I got on a deer blind that was and uh, sat on this deer blind. And actually uh, spent the night on the deer blind. I woke up, and about an hour before sunrise, that thing couldn't have been more than about 20 yards from me. Hmm. It was so loud, Art, that you could the air was it's like the air was vibrating, and you could you could you could feel the vibrations in your chest. All right, here it was awesome. Here is the other sound. Now this is said to be. A Bigfoot sound. Uh, so since you've heard something, you listen carefully to the following, because this has been um, verified to be an actual Bigfoot sound. Let's see how this one goes with you. That obviously recorded at some distance does that sound anything like well you know there are actually uh, now the, the I, I work with some guys uh, that uh, they call the Texas Bigfoot Research uh, Center mm -hmm. and they have some photographs of what they call these vocalizations and they uh, and, and there are actually a number of different calls that the creatures make the one of them that 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 loud one the first one you played yes that's what I heard that was a howling uh, just an un indescribable howling sound. They also have a, 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 a uh, another call that's uh, almost more bird-like, uh, very loud and very higher pitched and is shorter, huh. uh, and like they'll make a series of those sounds. Uh, I got an email from a, a lady who grew up in the uh, in the swamps around Lafayette, Louisiana, and uh, she said and. And Louisiana, they call it. They call them the loop, uh, the uh, loop garou or werewolf. Yes. And uh, she said it was common knowledge way back in the swamps, and the old people actually left food out for these things. And she said that they heard them frequently, and that there was there was no animal, 
known to any of the people in the swamps that could make that sound. It was totally, uh, you know, couldn't be duplicated by anything else. Wow. Now, I will say this. After that experience, I have not gone back into the woods alone again. I wouldn't either. Yeah. So you're not crazy. I'm brave, but I'm not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you would not seek out, um, a after what you experienced, you wouldn't seek out an encounter? I mean, even with others, or would you? Well, yes. You would? I would, and I'll tell you why. So you're a little crazy. Yes, but I, my feeling was at that time when that was happening that I was totally at the mercy of that thing. Yeah. And that um, if it had wanted me, I, it could have had me right there. Well, now, so that's, I mean, that is an yeah. interesting uh, point you bring up. I, I, you know, I, I think I've talked to most of the biggest Bigfoot researchers in the world, mm -hmm. and uh, inevitably they say that really... Even they say the same thing you did. If it had wanted me or wants somebody, believe me, it's got them. It, it, mm -hmm. But it really doesn't. That these are really uh, friendly creatures. These these are they are creatures that uh, mean us no harm. Yes, and you know, and I think there's a, a possibility that they may need. The, the, I think the places where these where these creatures can exist are dwindling, and I think that uh, I think there may be somewhat in their interest for us to know more about them, and are and hopefully to protect some of the areas where they exist, because I think that they need the energetic conditions that produce those ghost lights mm -hmm. to exist. To exist in order for them to be able to manifest in this space time. Yeah, the right. problem that you've got, and anybody else who believes what you believe, would mm -hmm. be that before you can get that protection, and you could get it, if, mm -hmm. if we proved uh, beyond all doubt the existence somehow of these creatures by getting a body, getting irrefutable evidence of some kind, then you could get the kind of protection you want until then. Uh, you just try and go in and get anything protected uh, with a story like this, and you'll hear the buzzsaws coming. Well, luckily, uh, about 100,000 acres of the big thicket was, has been protected. Yeah, but not for that reason, I believe. No, not for that reason. But, but luckily, there are some, you know, there are, there are some places, and, and they do inhabit the, the preserve. Uh, as a matter of fact, I talked to a uh, park ranger at one of the units of the preserve and there have been reports particularly among the Native Americans who live right on the edge of the northern part of the Big Thicket Preserve of the wild man sightings. I got an email also uh, today from a gentleman who has a hunting camp in that same area. He says that he's had a number of encounters with them. Okay, now I'm I'm also, I've got a lot of sources, you know, because of what I do here. I'm, I'm lucky I have all these sources. Right. And I'm hearing all these stories about sudden Bigfoot appearances, sudden Bigfoot interaction with human beings. I mean, all kinds of uh, interaction between these creatures and human beings, that it's really, really, really seriously on the increase. And could it does that, seem that way. And, and you figure it's because we're encroaching... I think it's yes. I think it's that, and 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 you know, it may maybe it's time. You know, I've always I've always thought that we're not talking about discovering uh, an animal here. We're talking about making contact. Well, yes. This is like a different culture, a completely different worldview, but that we as human beings also have latent within us the very powers that these creatures have. That may well be, but uh, by thousands of years we have lost touch with how to... We have it. lost touch with it, yes. <coughs> Maybe even uh, millions of years. I, I, I don't know. Do you have any sense uh, of how old these beings might be? No. But I, I do know that the Native Americans, many many of them, refer to them as the ancient ones. 
that they go back to very ancient times. Huh. The, uh, you know, I, let me let me digress a little bit in talking about. You know, I said that the big the the Bragg Road was a straight line. Yeah. Are you familiar with the the, the straight line? Uh, you know, the, the ancient many ancient cultures built these straight tracks. Oh, sure. Yeah. The Celtic culture and the American Indians and so on. Well, a lot of people thought it was so straight that people thought they were runways. Right. Uh -huh. no, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, if you've ever read, um, you know, like John Michelle and and uh, John Keel, a number of people written about this, uh, Ted Holliday yes. uh, wrote a very famous book called The, the Dragon and the Disc. Apparently, one of the functions of these lines was to connect power points and to facilitate the flow of energy on these lines that they call the uh -huh. serpent power and so on. There's an interesting thought. Uh huh. Well, I think a kind of a geographic conduit. Uh huh. I and think that listen, the... you're going to have to hold uh, right at that point. We're at, okay. the, we're at the bottom of the hour. Really a good point to break, actually, and this is good bumper music to do it. It's in the woods. It's in the thicket. But if you put me down for another, and it's looking at you, maybe even many of them, thousands. From west of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies at 1-800-825-5033. First time callers may reach Art at area code 775-727-1222. Or call the wild card line at 775-727-1295. To talk with Art on the toll-free international line, call your AT&T operator. And have them dial 800-893-0903. Wild thing, I think you move me. Sorry, I couldn't resist. I want to know for sure. I wonder if there's any stories about these things getting interested in our women. You move me. What? <laughs> we'll be right back. It's back into the thicket with Rob Riggs, uh, who's written a book, by the way. And you're certainly going to want, you're definitely going to want to see his website. We've got a link up. And I understand the traffic uh, has lessened a little now, and you've got a chance of getting in, so you might give it another try. Just go to tonight's guest info, and uh, you will see his website listed. I hope I don't uh, crash it again. I don't mean to do that. Uh, it's just that when something this fascinating comes along. What are you going to do? You've got to show everybody. I mean, the website is absolutely awesome. So go to artbell.com, go to program, tonight's guest info. And you're going to want to go down and click on uh, the second. To, actually, the book, his book is the first link, uh, which will take you to the book in the big thicket on the trail of the wild man. And then below it, the website. Click on the website, and let's see if I can get in. Yes. 
And then when you do get in, don't click on the intro at the top. Go to the bottom of the page, click there on intro, and oh my, you are on your way. And you will see exactly what he's talking about. We were talking about straight lines. That's the first thing you're going to see is this incredibly straight, eerie, strange, very strange road. And then you're going to be taken on a little trip from there. Uh, then, of course, you can scroll down the page and see the uh, formation of this fog that then becomes uh, one of these lights or plasma balls or whatever the hell they are. All right, uh, we're, we're, we're back on the air again. Okay. So, uh, lines, straight lines. Well, all right, I, I, I want to I say this first. Uh, people have seen the wild man step out of that fog. Uh, they have? Yes. Um... And, and this is consistent with observations of the of, of the um, in, in England. There are many places in England, or not many, but some of the traditional ghost light uh, sightings areas will have what they call you know the luminous fog, and and people will see anthropomorphic forms, human-like forms, shadows within the within those lights. Oh brother! Yeah, it's, this is seriously weird stuff. Uh, now, yeah, well, li listen. Let me tell you a little story. Um, are you a listener to the show? Uh, I am when, I, when I'm up that late. Or... Answer, I do. There's a, there's, a, there's a fella over the hill from me in Las Vegas who's a friend of mine. Yeah. And he is, he's a billionaire. You know, he's big time rich. Uh, his name is Bob Bigelow, and he, he runs NIDS, uh, which is really a very serious uh, scientific uh, investigatory group that's funded uh, you know with his money and oh they do some incredible incredible work um he had this uh has this farm where they set up some uh infrared uh observation you know through um uh, through uh, night vision right and uh, a couple or several of his top scientists mm -hmm. observed a light forming, a kind of a fog, as uh, right. same thing you're talking about, mm -hmm. and they saw a creature come out of it, exactly. liter literally come out of it. And right. my God, it sounds like what you're talking about. Yes. Here. Now these straight lines, we were talking about how in ancient cultures that they would actually build these lines to connect these power points, and they would conduct the serpent power energy and the, the dragon power they had different names for it and many of these cultures their their whole technology was and their whole culture was centered around a technology that utilized this energy i think what happened in the case of the bragg road is that inadvertently uh, a straight line connected some major power points in the east texas now there have been there are some really strange effects other than the light itself that that occur there. Uh, one of these is sometimes you can go there, and the energy can be such that there is this feeling, like say like you're sitting in your car, and I've had I've had this happen to me, and all of a sudden you feel like you're moving backwards. Hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh huh. I felt that. Sure. You felt that. Sure. Uh, I had I had a witness tell me that uh, you know the typical kid, kid, a lot of kids go out there to look for these lights. It's almost a tra it is a tradition in Southeast Texas, and they had that experience. And the wild man showed up right after that. A lady emailed me today, and she was a, a displaced uh, Southeast Texan living up there in the Northwest, and she said she went out with a group. They saw the light in the distance, and it kept. And, and and it kept approaching them, and they and they could they got the sense that it was moving at an incredible speed toward them. Mm. And she said that suddenly we felt like we were moving a hundred miles an hour backwards, <laughs> and the light actually came up to them and at, went through their car. <laughs> Um, I wouldn't go out there. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do that. I, I, I had, and I've had witnesses tell me that the light would go through their car, and I've had I've had witnesses tell me that there was a shadow 
like of a, a human silhouette within the light as it as it approached them. Shadow light. Yeah. <laughs> now you go you go over to Louisiana, uh -huh. and they will tell you that there are wizards that know how that can transform themselves into a ball of light. They call it the Thiefole. Uh -huh. You go over to Mississippi, and the Choctaw Indians will tell you the same thing. That there are wizards who move around in balls of light and can, you know, this is the old shapeshifter. Yeah, it's interesting tradition. to take the, the mythology and put it together with the real world uh -huh. reports, and uh, there's probably something there. Oh. Now, I, I tell you, I tell you something else interesting. I uh, there's another place where the wild, the wild man is not only seen on the back road in the big thicket. It's right. actually seen in a large area. Right. There's an old bridge in the preserve, the National Preserve, and I interviewed some kids from Saratoga, Texas, a little small town in the surrounded by the preserve. And uh, who told me that they had seen what they called an ape-looking critter a number of times near this bridge. I went there to take some photographs as an illustration for a, a possible hardcover edition of my book mm -hmm. just to illustrate the story in the book. I went there. It was about dusk, Art, and I took uh, five or six shots of the bridge from different angles. Right. When I developed the film, there were, in two frames, there was a light of a very distinct shape from two different distances, from two different perspectives, as if the thing had moved. Do you have those on your website? I don't have them on my website. Uh, I have not. They have never been published, but I will. I will put them on there. Would you? Yes. All right, uh, 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 and they have never been published before. And you got you caught that. See, that is interesting. You caught the same light from two different D perspectives. two different perspectives. Yeah, that's... one close up, one far away, and you can see it's the same thing, the same shape, and you can see that it is moved. Hmm. Now, another interesting thing. Uh, have you heard about these orbs? Oh. Uh... I've heard so much about these orbs that we've had to take an entire portion of our website and, and <laughs> devote it to nothing but orb photographs, yes. The orbs show up on Bragg Road, and they show up in areas where there are Bigfoot sightings. Yeah, what is your best guess about what these orbs are? Well, you know, we were talking earlier about the different dimensions Yes, sir. Uh, I uh, I favor the theory of what are called Riemann surfaces. That th that you know ordinarily uh, when you're talking about a dimension, you're talking about you know we have this is three dimensions. This world is three dimensions. Right. And then you have fourth dimension would be you know another another perpendicular. Mm -hmm. Well, the idea of the Riemann surfaces is that you have three-dimensional universes that are parallel, as it were, but that have uh, what they call multiple connectivity. And that is that these, these uh, parallel three-dimensional universes can actually have places where they connect. Uh, portals, uh, yeah. points of power, and yeah, the, the exact points. thing that we've been talking about uh, that uh, Ms. Bigelow documented um, in, well, in the ranch, right. at the ranch, I don't want to say where it is. I think it's possible, Art, that the ghost light, the standing ghost light locations may be the, the, the places portals. Where, where these uh, dimensions intersect. And that these creatures are able to move back and forth from one uh, three-dimensional Riemann surface to another mm -hmm. when the energy that manifests these lights is activated. And of course, you know, the uh, southeast Texas, the, the energies that uh, manifest these ghost lights sometimes reach incredible intensities. Well, 
earlier we attributed some intelligence or consciousness to these energies, right? Right. Well, to, yeah, at least to the uh, to the lights and to the creatures. Yes. So, do you think we're talking about the energy itself? actually being an intelligence or do you think that there is some separate intelligence organizing this occurrence or uh, 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 creating this portal that we're talking about well that's that's interesting uh, Jacques Berger wrote a book now he was the co-author of Morning of the Magicians which is a classic paranormal investigative book came out in the 70s he wrote a book called Secret Portals, uh, Secret Doors of the Earth, mm -hmm. in which he discussed these Riemann surfaces and so on. And his idea was that uh, the doors, doorways, could be made from one. Uh, and I hesitate to use the word dimension because they're both three dimensional. You follow well, me? Uh, to us, though, to uh, perceptually, dimension probably is an all right word. Okay, that that he, he felt that there was a psychic, a psychic component involved in bridging from mm -hmm. one dimension to another. Gotcha. And so, so what might be happening in the case of these uh, creatures is that they are able to supply that psychic component because their worldview, see, uh, they haven't atrophied. Those powers have not atrophied. Those psychic powers have not atrophied in them. In fact, they're probably fully developed. That they're able to supply that psychic component and literally create doors or passageways between these Riemann surfaces. Have you uh, experimented at all with night vision? No, but I, uh, you know Linda Moulton Howe, of course. Of course. Well, she and I have become friends, and we are going to be doing some research, field research, this spring, using some uh, r rather uh, advanced technology that had recently developed uh, in some of these locations. Because and long, and long we'd be happy to report back to you, you know, if we come up with something. We'd well, that, that, that's back. interesting. In other words, when I said that, you said that. So that suggests to me that something, either either that technology or technology related to it is what you're going to use in your investigation. Is that right. fair? Sir? Is that fair? Yes. <laughs> well, I've got a feeling it's going to succeed because... I think that long before whatever it is that we're talking about here is manifested to the human eye, and I mean long before and long after, uh, there will be things visible in the infrared that are not visible uh, to our naked eye. Yeah, we picked it up with a regular 35-millimeter camera. Uh, right, but that uh -huh. was at a pretty high point of the, of the manifestation. Correct. So, in other words, you might catch it earlier. Right. <laughs> I didn't yeah, we're know. really excited about it. I had no idea you were involved with uh, Linda. Yes. She's a very serious uh, researcher. She was just in the Far East. Uh, has she told you uh, the story of uh, her trip? Well, I know that she went over to where, Laos, Laos to study the wild men. Oh, that's correct. Uh-huh. Yes. I told her, I said, I mean, we got them right here. <laughs> uh, uh, we got them in Texas. <laughs> uh, it, we, we, I think it would be a, a, a very profitable area of investigation for her. Now think about this, Art. These, uh, if these ghost light locations are these uh, points of multiple connectivity, they could also be like uh, wormholes, so to speak, from one place in this world to another place. Well, that's what they would be. They would be, uh, in essence, some sort of wormhole. Right. Sure. Um, and, and it might be that it might even be, this might be stretching it, or maybe it isn't stretching it. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, creatures can come from one, one side to this side, uh, then why not have the opposite be true? Right. Why not... <laughs> Here's a pretty interesting question. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> uh, if, if, if you were um, in the area of, of the formation, the kind of formation you've got a photograph of, mm -hmm. and you had the opportunity... To jump through it? Yes, sir. 
<laughs> Would you do it? I asked first. <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, it is. Yes. I guess I'd have to, I'd just have to let that situation arise. Uh, is it something that you've discussed with Linda? No. And, you know, here, here's the thing. From my experience on Bragg Road, uh, you know, uh, there's a tradition down there where people will take their families out there, and it's like a it's like a picnic, you know. Uh -huh. Oh, let's go look for the light. Right. Well, when my kids were little, they used to want want me to take them out there, and I said, "There's no way I'm going to take you out there. There's things that happen out there that we do not understand." <laughs> well, I've and, had a number of guests on my show, uh, Rob, that have been involved in some pretty strange things with uh, electromagnetics and the rest of it, and some of them, Rob, have disappeared. And I mean disappeared. They're not around anymore now. They're just flat gone? I mean, yeah, you've got to imagine that's at least part of the risk of doing something like that, the probability that you might get there and you might not get back. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think that is a possibility. And, you know, people ask me, well, why... Do you want to know about these things? Why do you want to study this? And how do you answer that? Well, Art, I think that the world is out of balance. Mm. And if you'll go back and, and study the, the traditional cultures that understood these energies and these connections with other worlds and so on, uh, you'll find that they had this concept of balance, of the need of maintaining balance, mm -hmm. and of the human beings as conscious entities participating in making that balance happen. And if you'll talk to the Hopi Indians... I have. Yes. Uh, they understand this concept. And what they say is the world that we have live in now, the modern Western uh, scientific materialistic culture mm -hmm. is out of balance and the reason it's out of balance is we cut ourselves off from our intuitive side and what's happened as a result of that is that we have lost contact with the spirit world Riders of the storm, into this house we're born, into this world we're thrown, like a dog without a bone and after out alone, riders on the storm, there's a killer on the road. His brain is swerving like a toad. J.K. Long Holiday. Let your children play. If you give this man a ride, sweet family will die. Killer on the road. Call Art Bell in the Kingdom of Nye from west of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies, 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at 1-775-727-1222. And the wild card line is open at 1-775-727-1295. To reach Art on the toll-free international line, call your AT&T operator and have them dial 800-893-0903. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell from the Kingdom of Nye. It is. My guest is Rob Riggs, and we're talking about all kinds of really, really rooting things. Bigfoot, wild man, plasma ball, balls of light, and perhaps something that coexists with us, or perhaps something that coexists in an adjacent dimension with us. Anyway, absolutely fascinating stuff, and we'll get right back to it. Well, 
I see my thunder was a bit premature, but that's all right. We'll take care of that. Uh, back now to our uh, our guest, Rob Riggs. Uh, Rob, welcome back. Thank you, sir. I've got a lot of people that would like to chat with you. All right. And I suppose they have questions or comments for you, uh, but you've opened up about 10,000 miles of <laughs> intriguing territory to talk about really. here. So, obviously, they've got questions. First time caller line, you're on the air with Rob Riggs. Hi. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Where are you? I am calling uh, from Austin, Texas. I'm All right. I'm 1200 out of San Antonio. Now, here's an interesting situation. You're both in the Austin area, mm -hmm. which means that uh, this signal is going about well, several hundred thousand miles for the two of you to be talking to each other right next to each other. <laughs> right here. Yeah, so you go right ahead. Well, actually, I'm in San Marcos, which is right down the road. But I was just... Well, in I, actually, I'm in Buda, which is almost in San Marcos. So. Well, there you go. There you go. Uh, I am actually from the Beaumont area. Uh, I grew up there and uh, graduated high school there in the early 90s. And I've spent, uh, or I've actually taken several trips up to, he called it the Saratoga Light, Bragg yeah. Road, many different things. Uh, but I've been up there many times uh, with different people. You know, it was kind of a teenage thing, like you said earlier. It was kind of a thing to do, and uh, I've I've seen it, and it's it's really a, a different experience. I don't really the best way to describe it would be, I guess, kind of spooky, uh, but definitely fog and the light coming at you and moving. It seems like you're moving away from it, and then all of a sudden, I've never actually had it go through the vehicle I was in, but it would reappear behind us. Once so, we got a certain point down the road. So you've seen all of this yourself? I have seen this myself. Yes, I have. More than once. Uh, I think twice. The one time I went out there, we did not see anything. But, I, you know, you never know. I guess it was just one of those things. But I've seen it twice out in Saratoga <laughs> uh, on the Bragg Road. It was. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, like like you were saying earlier, it's kind of a thing that, that you do when you're in high school and you're young and you want to go out and drink and party and have a good time. And It's, it's like a rite of passage in southeast Texas, are it, Exactly, exactly. I mean, there's a lot of rites of passage, I guess, in southeast <laughs> Texas as far as the big thicket goes. Well, uh, yeah, I'm I went sure on a lot right. of camping trips out there and, and saw a lot of weird things then, too. Uh-huh. Uh, well, I, Camp, I know. Camp Erland is a Boy Scout camp up in there, and they had a lot of uh, strange lights around Camp Erland. Uh, when I was a kid, going uh, to to scout camp up there, I, I know uh, I know this. I know that a lot of horror movies begin on a road like that late at night, <laughs> and uh, usually there's some loving going on, and and then all that's left, all that's left after it is just pieces and gore. Well, uh, that that might be true. <laughs> and I don't mean Al Gore. <laughs> well, it it was definitely a unique experience. Uh, you know. Being out there with a group of people like that, uh, it was kind of hard for everybody not to say, "Wow, you know, get a load of that. That's that's different. Uh, I don't I don't know where that came from." And seeing a light, this was at night. Seeing a light way down the road, just in the middle of the road, and just hmm. coming at you is, and then going away, and then reappearing behind you. And there was lots of stories. People would say it was swamp gas, or that it was this or that. I really never knew what it was. I knew it was different, and that everybody kind of felt a little different when we were there. It was kind of an edge, I guess. Everybody was kind of on edge, and I don't know what it was, and I really couldn't explain to you what it was, but it was definitely a unique experience. And I've hunted those woods also. I know you're talking about the wild man creature and everything. I've hunted in those woods, too, and I've heard some things sitting in a deer blind out in the in the big thicket area and heard things in the mornings, early, early mornings, and late at the evenings right about dark. It's Weird sounds is all I could say. I wouldn't know what it was. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would not know what it was and wouldn't have any explanation. Yeah, and I'll tell you something. If I if I didn't know who was on what line, I'm not sure I'd be able to tell the two of you apart. You sound dun just dun just dun just just line. It's our well, East Texas accent, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, yeah, but it's it's the deer blind talk and all yeah, the rest of it. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Well, it's a Texas thing, I guess. Well, you know, Art, it's like I was telling you. Professor Otsuki said that in his experience, more people in Texas had seen these. Uh, lights and anywhere he knew of. Apparently. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. I wonder why. Why? Uh, do, do, well, uh, do we haven't got into this, but uh, do you believe that Texas is on some of these lines? Yes. That we're talking. Yes. I do. And where do they run from Texas? Do you, can you tell me? Well, one of the interesting things about this that I get into in the book is what. Uh, 
you know, there's you've heard of the planetary grid theories, I'm sure. Of course. Yeah. I think that the ghost-like, standing ghost-like locations may also be indicators of vertices or of the of the grid. Hmm. And there does seem to be some geometrical alignments of certain of the ghost light areas on 30th degree north latitude, hmm. which runs uh, all the way across Texas, all the way from far west Texas, all the way through to uh, the big thicket. And interestingly enough, we were talking about the morpholites earlier. Yes. The morpholites and the braglite occur on exactly the same latitude, 800 miles apart. Well, that would seem to bolster that idea, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. And if you follow that latitude east, there's a there's a ghost light that occurs in Gonzales, Louisiana, on that same latitude. And a, a fellow uh, uh, emailed me some time ago and said that there had been one in Mobile, Alabama, near Mobile, Alabama, but it had disappeared when the area was developed. There are going to be a number of people who would like to email you, and if you have the guts, you can give out your email address. Do you wish? Okay, uh, my email address is crriggs. That's C R R I G G S at A U S T I N T X, Austin Tex dot net. Wait a minute. And Art, I've had over 50 emails since you uh, posted the promo on your website. Uh, uh, Even okay, before coming on the air. Oh, yeah, okay. C R Riggs R I G G S at uh-huh. Austin T X T X as dot in net. Texas dot net. Yeah, A U S T I N T X dot net. Oh, you get plenty of email, all right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um uh wildcard line, you're on the air with uh, uh with Rob Riggs. Hello. Hi Art. Hi Rob, how you Hi. doing? Okay, sir. Where are you? I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. Uh I was stationed out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, about eight years ago, and I came across something that I have not told anyone about, and tell you the truth, it scared the living daylight, 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 daylight. I was out uh, on the far east side of the base, uh, about two, three o'clock in the morning, just running around, killing time. I lived in the area, and uh, came across a coon hound that found out later had rabies and uh this animal turned and apparently thought i had it cornered and uh something came out of the tree tore it clean in two i looked the thing square in the face i can't tell you what it looked like the one thing i do remember were those eyes mm-hmm. and when you played that recording about half an hour ago art yes sir it made the hair on the back of my neck and my beard stand straight out. Even your beard? Yeah. No, I'd, I'd like a photo of that. Uh, so, <laughs> now, the so, thing stood upright like a man? Uh, yeah. And it was uh, in the trees? Came down it, out of the tree? It, it came out of a tree that was behind me. Mm-hmm. And it and tore it, that thing in half? Mm-hmm. Damn near. The Bigfoot are known to hate dogs, uh, Art. Oh. Yeah. They're they're known to hate dogs. I think dogs are able to detect them. But to be able to physically uh, uh, manifest, uh, that's it, it. Almost feels like a different kind of stage. But I, I guess not really. Not uh, we found fur. They found droppings. Mm-hmm. They found footprints. That's physical manifestation. So I guess why not, huh? I hear a lot of stories about them killing dogs. Really? Yeah. Come on of, in. Mm-hmm. A lot of dog lovers aren't going to want to hear that, but uh, they, they don't. Yeah. Uh, well, anything else, uh, sir? Well, the the thing that that really disturbed me about it, I've only talked to this talked about this to about two three other people mm-hmm. since this happened. Uh, my roommate at the time, he and I went out to the same area because it was only about two miles from where we lived, mm-hmm. and we followed the tracks from where I was when it happened, about three, four hundred yards back in the wood line, and they stopped. That so was it. They no just more. Stopped. Did you look in the trees? We checked everything. <laughs> there were no claw marks. There were uh-huh. no uh, broken twigs on any of the trees nearby. Uh-huh. Nothing. Huh. Well, that's typical also. 
Well, uh, there, so there's your dimension shift, see? It just flat physically disappeared. Right. <sighs> Thank you for All that right. story. That's how do we, uh, pretty amazing. How do we pr proceed, in your opinion, scientifically, to investigate? Well, I mean, here's is, what I think, Art. This is so fascinating, but how do you proceed? Well, for one thing, we have to take an interdisciplinary approach to this. And I think one of the reasons there hasn't been a lot of progress made uh, in researching this stuff is that our, 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 we're too uh, specialized uh, and, and too compartmentalized in, you know, in our branches of knowledge. Right. And I think that in order to investigate this, these phenomena uh, thoroughly, we're going to have to call on physicists like Otsuki, uh, wildlife biologists who are willing to look at the possibilities of these things existing. I know one in Russia and one in Canada. Uh, we may need uh, geologists, cultural anthropologists, you know, psychologists, and I think we probably need some American Indian shamans. Well, that'd be quite a group to put together. Yes, and I, I would like to see that happen. Uh, I, you know, I'm not sure you can investigate by committee, but the fact of the matter is, I, I think that we're so out of touch with this you know, the reality that these things pertain to in this culture. That that's why it seems so fantastic and otherworldly to us. So that would be our only hope uh, in terms of investigation. Uh, the shaman, for example. Uh -huh. uh, somebody who is at least uh, far enough into that world uh, to sort of take the, the first step in for everybody. I think so, and you know what this shows is that those is that these other worlds can have physical contact with this world. This is not just a, a, a you know like dreaming or uh, imagining or visualizing. You know this is this is real physical stuff. Well, you've got to wonder with the number of people that disappear every year. Certainly, uh -huh. there's plenty of. Uh, this world explanation for why people disappear, but then there's no doubt plenty that cannot be explained in that way. And who is to say that some have not crossed mm -hmm. from here to another world? And, and possibility, and the, and the only ones we hear from are the ones that got away. Yeah, that's right, not the ones that, uh, uh -huh. that got there. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with uh, Rob Riggs. Hello. Hi, my name is Travis. I'm calling from Conroe, Texas. All right. Texas, <laughs> yes. And, uh, well, I, I actually grew up in the Sour Lake area. Um, and I spent most of my young life hunting out on, uh, on a piece of property that butts up against the, uh, the big thicket. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we'll hunt, you know, in the woods and in addition to that up and down pipelines. Right. And I've been sitting in a deer blind looking down a pipeline and seeing a man cross the road. Now we're talking about a distance of two or three miles. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not uncommon to see something like that because there's, you know, it's, it's a big common lease. Lots of people hunt on it. Mm -hmm. But there weren't that many people up at the lease that day. And I came back to camp, asked who was down there because we all have to sign in before we go out and hunt. And nobody was down in that area. Uh, in addition to that, just lots of strange noises early, early in the morning and then late at night. Right. Um, Do, can you describe those noises? It, they, it sounded a lot like the howling Art was playing earlier. Mm -hmm. um, it was real faint, though. I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't. Like in the distance. In the distance. Uh, have you heard you heard any reports, any sightings like that anywhere near Sour Lake? Yes, that's where I was when I heard the thing howling was near Sour Lake. Oh man. Yeah. It was the first I've heard of it, and I'm just real surprised to hear about my part of the world being on the radio. <laughs> well, it is, sir, and your part of the world is responding uh, big time. Here's, here's, a, here's a very interesting uh, fast blast on computer. It's Wade in Huntsville, Texas, wherever that is. He says, I've got two dogs, and they just totally went into fright when you played that Bigfoot sound. I live in the East Texas woods, so it's East Texas, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's near Conroe. And uh, his dogs didn't like that sound at all. <laughs> yeah. But that, that would figure, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah. In other words, a dog would instinctually know 
that uh, whatever that is, it doesn't like them. Right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. All right. West of the uh, Rockies, you're on the air with Rob Briggs. Hi. Hello. Oh, I didn't push. That's a sticky button. West of the Rockies, now you're on the air. Hi. Hi, Rob. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Hi. I have a, a question for you and a comment also. All right. On the question is, do you think they can communicate with us in normal English? Hmm. You know, that, that is a particularly interesting question because there are some Bigfoot researchers, I've had them on the program, that have played tapes that sound just like human voice, sort of, close. Hmm, that's really interesting. Right, uh, but, but, Do I think they can communicate with us in English? Yes. I have no idea. You haven't heard any reports of it? Of course, or... I'm from Texas, and I would hope they would also speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I lived most of my life in uh, Montana. Yeah. I, have a, I have a good friend. That's, he's basically a mountain man. He's been in the woods for nearly 40 years. And um, last spring, they, him and another guy found tracks um, mm -hmm. deep in the woods in the uh, Bull River area. Mm -hmm. And he said, and he was really, I mean, he knows every animal in the woods, and he said the tracks just ended and just mm -hmm. disappeared. And there's no way unless that thing just flew. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this guy's very. I mean, he, if you walk through the woods, you could tell if you were there. I mean, he's. Yeah. Uh, I hear. I hear those stories over and over again. Well, a guide spent three months. He's seen it several times, and he spent mm -hmm. three months back in this area trying to find it, and he never could. Yeah. But you I, know, uh, you're talking about communicating. I, I don't. I don't know if they speak our language, but I do think they may have uh, kind of tel telepathic powers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And actually, if you were receiving a telepathic message, it might be very difficult to tell the difference between that and speech. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I was being facetious, but I think you're right. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you very much, caller, and uh, uh, take care. Uh, first time caller, you're on the air with Rob Riggs, close to the bottom Hi. of the hour. Hello. Hi, gentlemen. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm from uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, uh, we had heard of uh, uh, ghost light. I guess is what you'd call it, um, when I was growing up in uh, Upper Michigan. And uh, a couple of years ago, I had the chance to go up with some friends. I wanted them to show it to me, and um, we went and saw it. And um, the interesting thing about it is, just based on what you've been talking about, is this light appears over an abandoned uh, railroad bed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, railroad beds, of course, are long and straight. Right. Oh, that's and I have I haven't heard of any uh, other sightings of creatures or anything like that. But uh, this light has been known to move, and when I saw it, it seemed pretty stationary. Right. But um, it was changing colors and stuff. Oh, that's. Um, but the fact that it occurred on something straight like a railroad track—that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. See, there's your ley line, your inadvertent ley line again. See. God, that's fascinating. I bet it was during the summer, too. All right, uh, hold on. We're at the bottom of the hour once again, Rob. Rob Riggs, whose book is In the Big Thicket on the Trail of the Wild Man. If you get on the trail of my website, you can get over there and get that book. Fascinating subject, fascinating man. I'm Art Bell. This is Coast to Coast AM. International line, call your AT&T operator and have them dial 800-893-0903. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell on the Premier Radio Networks. This is uh, Gordon Lightfoot. And when you, inter I, I got to interview Gordon Lightfoot, and uh, when you interview him, he is exactly like he sounds when he sings. And by that I mean, when he's singing, he's singing about what happened to him. He's a pretty wild guy, Gordon Lightfoot. Anyway, Rob Riggs is my guest. We're talking about what's in the thickets. And we'll be right back. Well, there really is so much in this world that we just simply don't understand, isn't there? And uh, tonight, that's what we're talking about with Rob Riggs. Uh, Rob, welcome back. Thank you, sir. Uh, your book is available, I take it, on Amazon.com and such? Yes, it is. How long has it been out? It came out this spring. What kind of reaction have you had? Well, you know, Art, 
the the material in this book is so weird that um, <laughs> and, and I've tried to connect a, a, a lot of different things and and it's been kind of hard to pigeonhole it. I had a little problem with the book distributors because you know they they wanted to label it a Texana item. <laughs> as oh, if, I'm as sorry, if, a what item? Texana, you know, just relating to Texas. Oh, I see. Uh, and uh, you know, I'd like to show some of these. Uh, Book distributors, the emails I'm getting from all over North America. Well, why don't you? <laughs> what would do it? Yeah, uh, but uh, it is available on Amazon.com, and you could go to any bookstore in the country and order it. It is available through the book distributors. All right. Well, if or uh, if you want an autographed copy, you can oh. uh, get on my website. I've got a, uh, you know, you can order it uh, by uh, credit card over my website, and I'll send you an autographed copy. And a secure server, I assume. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you don't have like an 800 number, do you? No, sir, I don't. Everybody has to have an 800 number. <laughs> yeah. All right, so then go to your website. I'm not as anyway. big as you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, here we go. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Rob Riggs. Hi. No, uh, I'm sorry. Again, that stupid button. West of the Rockies, you're on the air now. Hi. Is this Rob? Yeah. yeah hi. Okay. Yes, sir, go ahead. Hi, my name is Boone, and uh, I'm in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Uh -huh. And... If my anybody's life is as weird as mine, <laughs> I, I would I would like to swap stories with them. All right. We were I came down from Alaska, me and my girlfriend. We went to this little campsite, and I would swear, and I would swear to this, we had a bigfoot living about 20 feet from us. He did not like me at all, but he liked my girlfriend. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> and they definitely have ESP powers. Uh -huh. They are definitely. Yeah. You know, I, I, I asked that uh, half in humor when I couldn't resist playing Wild Thing and all the rest of that. But, <laughs> uh, but um, is there, does there seem to be any preference uh, with regard to human beings? Uh, the different sexes uh, do, are, do do they react differently to women than to men? I, I don't know, but I have I haven't been able to get very many women to go out in the big thicket with me, Art. It's a good <laughs> point. It's a really good point, and so you might not uh, have knowledge in the area. Okay, well, yeah, that, that make, absolutely makes sense. First yeah. time caller line, your turn with Rob Riggs. Hello. 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 This is uh, Larry in Tennessee. Yes, Hello, Larry. Hi. I'm about. Uh, Two and a half miles west of a place called Wartburg, Tennessee, mm -hmm. and about two and a half miles east of the uh, Catoosa Wildlife Game Reserve area. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, in '99, I was doing a night watching job at a place called Nemo. It's about a mile and a half from here, and uh, I saw uh, six at one time. I saw six Bigfoots, I guess you would call them. Wow. Uh, they crossed an, uh, what we call an EPA fence, a silt fence. Mm -hmm. You know, it stops, uh, water from flowing off into the river or something. Right. And, uh, five of them were, uh, darker color and one was a lighter color. And it, it, it really shocked me. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess worked it did. here, you know, about six months and I saw more than once I saw. Strange things. And, uh, All right, six six at once. Uh, Rob, what's the likelihood that uh, that that would be a family? I hear that these creatures, um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of the Bigfoot people I've interviewed have said that they're family oriented, really family oriented. I talked. Uh, I was on a doing a radio show down in Beaumont, in Texas, and a lady called from Port Arthur, which is near there, and uh, said when when she was a a child, they used to go out swimming in the bayou near Fort Arthur. And uh, they went out to go swimming one day, and they saw a, an adult and a child, uh, you know, a smaller right. Bigfoot. Right. So that is, that is uh, you know, that happens. And as, fr as friendly as uh, they've, been, they've said to have been, mm -hmm. I know of a case which I can't fully... 
discuss uh, in uh, the center part of the country. I better not say any more than that. Um, the south central part of the country, where somebody harmed uh, a Bigfoot, and they are suffering now every day through, get this, having stones thrown at them by what appears to be the relatives of this creature that they injured. I can't talk any more about this case, I guess, than that right now, but I'm really serious. I, this is really serious. They're, they're being stoned, literally, 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 literally. Mm. You ever hear of anything like that? I've heard of, I've heard of stones appearing apparently from nowhere and being thrown at people. Yeah. I've never heard of Bigfoot doing that. Uh. Yeah. Um, of course, there are not any stones down in the big thicket. I, I all swamp. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. There are where I'm talking about, and I uh, I wish I could say more, but it's under investigation. Uh, wild card line, you're on the air with uh, Rob Briggs. Hi. Hi. Hello. How are you, Arpa? <clears throat> Excuse me. Where are you, sir? I'm calling from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. Well, yeah. okay. Good. I've, uh, I've actually, I just got to say one thing. Art, I've listened to your show since about '94, and I love your show, man. This this is the coolest stuff I've, I've heard. Thank ever. you. Thank you. Um, actually, what I was uh, wondering is, has anybody, like to this date, actually caught one of these things? Good question. And you know, uh, there's another thing too uh, about that Harp Project up in Alaska. Maybe they could use uh, that to find them, find the, the caves <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> well, uh, Harp is said to affect uh, people psychologically, so you never know about maybe Bigfoot, too. Uh, the first question is a really good one, though. Uh, what's the lore regarding that? Has anybody ever trapped, caught, or otherwise uh, even temporarily uh, detained one of these beings? Well, there are, there are stories, and you don't know whether they're apocryphal or what, because we don't have the, you know, the bodies in hand, but... There are stories dating back, you know, to the last century where supposedly that there have been some captured. Uh, if you can go back and read the literature, uh, you know, John Green and some of these fellows that uh, kind of pioneered Bigfoot search, and they supposedly traced back uh, some stories, and I think there was one in Tennessee and, uh, where, you know, now, where, again, whether these are apocryphal stories, I don't know. Now, somebody asked me, well, has there ever been one, the body of one found? Right. Uh, like a roadkill or something. Right. And uh, uh, the, uh, there's a website, uh, and, and, you know, anything you see on the Internet, to me, is suspect. Yep. Uh, but uh, there, there are some sites that have photographs of supposed... Uh, Roadkill. Some of it looks fairly interesting. There's one on a website called Crypto Keeper that uh, was uh, that was forwarded to me by uh, Lou Farish, who has a UFO organization in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a a body of a roadkill alleged uh, in Deritter, Louisiana. Now, Deritter, Louisiana, is right across the Sabine River from the Big Thicket. Oh, now you see. Uh, the Internet is a two-edged sword. Uh, while right. everything is suspect, it's also the venue where things will be seen that otherwise you would never have would a chance. Would be suppressed, you right. You never would see it. That's exactly. right. Exactly. Now, you know, there's, an, uh, there's a story that, uh, you know, frequently uh, there are stories that, uh, uh, that uh, come up about people finding bodies of, what are assumed to be chimpanzees or baboons or apes. Mm -hmm. There there was a story that came up in the 1950s. There was an old uh, big thicket uh, guide named uh, Lance Rozier. And supposedly somebody took him the body of uh, what they thought was a, a gorilla that had, that they found alongside the road yes, in, in Hardin County. Right. Uh huh. And they just thought it was a gorilla. You know, they didn't have any, and they just assumed that it escaped from a zoo or something like that, you know. And, uh, you know, and what is the likelihood that one of them would be run over? I mean, they're, they're intelligent beings, and they're mainly in very rural areas, so. Well, it's not likely, but it's yeah. an outside possibility. Yeah, but there is there is a story that one was taken to him to be identified. 
Do you, uh, do you know and, what? Do you know what became of it? No. Uh, and but the assumption was now the, the the story I read didn't even link it to the wild man stories or the Bigfoot stories. They just mm -hmm. assumed it was a chimpanzee or something. Gotcha. Uh -huh. All right. Um, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Rob Briggs. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Where are uh, you? I'm in Beaumont, Texas. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bell, uh, Mr. Riggs, it's a pleasure to meet y'all. I've, it's been, I've listened to you all the time. And uh, I just want to let uh, y'all know that I was at Bragg Road tonight. Um, in fact, I actually, right. I actually listened to the broadcast. You were at Bragg Road tonight? I was at Bragg Road, yeah. Did the light show up? No, uh, there was uh, quite a bit of traffic, actually. There was uh, <laughs> about three other vehicles up I and down the road. I tried to call Don Briscoe down there to tell him... <laughs> So you, you have an affiliate in Beaumont, Texas, Art. Yes, yes, sir. And I tried to call uh, Don Briscoe to ask him to tell the listeners to be uh, sure and tune in down there. Well, but I'll be damned if I would go down Bragg Road <laughs> at, in the middle of the night listening to this program. No way. Art, we wanted to invite you down. Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, we've been looking uh, to take some uh, road trips, so maybe, maybe. But well, you were actually there tonight, huh, sir? Yes. I really didn't, uh, when we drove down it, uh, coming off the farm road, uh, we went about six miles down and turned around, and there was a, a truck that passed once or mm -hmm. twice, but there was no vehicles when we was coming back out, and there was, we did see way up ahead, a flash of light go across the road mm -hmm. real quick, right. and then about, I would say about four or five minutes later, another light came back across the other way. Now, I couldn't tell how far ahead of it it was, of, of us it was, but that's all that I had, had saw. Well, that'll do. And you, and you were listening to the show while you I sure was. I, in fact, I made it a point to go out there tonight because I'd never been to Bragg Road before. So you wanted to listen to the show from there? Exactly. That's great. <laughs> well, that's you, great. You Texans really are a different breed, aren't you? <laughs> let, me tell you let me tell you all this story. I had a guy call in when I was doing a show down there, and uh, he had heard about the Bragg Light, and he was dating a girl that lived over in Batson. And they would drive right by Bragg Road when they were going to church. So one night he said, well, let's go on down there. Huh. So they go down there, they get out on the road, and uh, the girl is kind of freaking out. And so she's wanting the guy to leave. Yeah. So he says, well, he needed to answer nature's call. <laughs> so he opens the door, to, uh -huh. you know, to do that, to yeah. get out, yeah. and the light shows up. <laughs> and then... Well, I don't put a crimp in nature's call. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the light goes off into the woods, and then, and then the wild man shows up, oh. jumps on the back of the, ho of, the, of the car, and starts shaking the car. With the girl in it. With the girl in it. Guy, <laughs> yeah, and this guy swore up and down that this was a true story. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> uh, I wonder if he ever got another date. <laughs> Not with that girl. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Rob Riggs. Hello. Yes, uh, Art. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is George in North Hills. Hello. I was up in uh, Bristol Cones about maybe two months ago. Uh huh. And, uh,. <laughs> I had uh, my dogs with me in my truck, and I was just, uh, it was out, it was it was probably 11.30 at night. My dog started growling, and then I could feel something really big it was, like, breathing down my back. Oh, man. And then I just, I turned around, I couldn't see nothing, you know, and then... Uh, <laughs> actually, actually breathing down your back? Yes, like he was breathing down my back. Oh, you know, I mean, this is the Bristol Cones, and you know, the Paiutes have a have a have a song for them, for the for the for the uh, the Bigfoot song. They sing in their mm. in their in some of the rituals, you know. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, and uh, a couple of other crazy things have happened up to me up there too. I've seen some lights that are. Where was this? This is up at uh, this is in the High Sierras. Uh-huh. It's a real sort of sacred grounds area, you know? Right. You know, it's, uh, you know, the mountains have all these geological forms and stuff mm -hmm. on them, and it's, uh, the Paiutes were really, 
I guess pretty I see American. Yeah, Americans, yeah. They have they have a they have a Bigfoot song they sing in the, and then they the, when they do the sweat lodges and stuff like that, you know. And I think I think it, that the it could be that the Bigfoot that's is sort of like a spiritual helper, you know. You know. Yeah, there saying? are some traditions that claim that they are like familiars to. Uh, you know that they come in to yeah. they call them in. You know they come mm-hmm. in and that's why you you know they they're like a spirit. So that's why nobody ever finds them. You know. So well, they live in two worlds. As exactly, you know, they yeah. come, they come in and out of, you know, just, uh-huh. you know, and it's, uh, yeah, Art, you ought to look up a couple of Paiute medicine, man. You're right, the thick of it. <laughs> in the thick of it, all right. Uh, your book, yes, sir. In the big thicket on the trail of the wild man, is it, um, is it full of anecdotal stories? Is it instructional in any way? How, how did you? Uh, well, the book is based on about 20 years of research of my own experience of field research going out into the woods uh, with of interviewing of eyewitnesses of uh, of correspondence with leading scientists and investigators from around the world and uh, it, it has a lot of stories and the stories are mainly from eyewitnesses in some cases I'll put uh, second or third hand stories if they uh, uh, you know corroborate or you know if they, if they if they're part of a pattern I don't put a lot of folklore in there right you know uh, and all of this is still going on today if not in greater magnitudes than in prior days right? yes that's a really really interesting thing to know there are many of us who believe uh, you know just we call it the veil Right. Whatever it is that separates here and there is beginning to lift a little bit, or or more frequently than it has in the past. And I, I agree. And 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 my my interest in all of this is what it implies about paradigm shift. Yeah, yeah. You uh-huh. you hit it right in the head. Listen, right. guess what? Our program is over. We got to go. What a pleasure it has been to have you on the air. It has been great. I, I've enjoyed the opportunity of talking to you and your listeners. Rob, thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. From the high desert, I'm Art Bell. <laughs> Ta-ta. Don't come easy. Don't Kingdom of Nye, from west of the Rockies, dial 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies, 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at 1-775-727-1222. Or use the wild card line at 1-775-727-1295. To reach Art on the toll-free international line, call your AT&T operator and have them dial 800-893-0903. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell on the Premier Radio Networks. Well, all right. Coming up in a moment, Rob Riggs. 
You know, I note here, though, uh, from people who are fast blasting me, uh, Rochester was on here bragging about their snow mountain. Uh, I'm being told here by people in the New York area that Buffalo is, a uh, trucker flashes me here, that Buffalo is trucking snow to Rochester for their snow mountain. <laughs> they certainly have snow to spare, right? But they're, they're trucking the snow all the way to Rochester for the mountain. Is that really true? <laughs> all right. Coming up in a moment, Rob Riggs, who is a journalist and uh, the former publisher of a series of award-winning community uh, newspapers down in Texas. His interest is in ghost lights, wild man sightings, and related phenomena. It all began when he was a child. Of course it did. When he heard tales about all of these things in his hometown of Sour Lake in Big Thicket Country, Riggs began writing about the subject more than 20 years ago while working as a reporter for the Kunst News. Since then, his studies of the phenomena have been featured in the Houston Chronicle and the Beaumont Enterprise. Riggs has also consulted on ghost lights for Waseda University in Tokyo and Harvard College Observatory. So all of that immediately ahead. Okay, here in the nighttime is Mr. Riggs, Rob Riggs. Rob, how are you? Good morning, Art. Good morning, I'm Rob. Fine. Where are you? I'm in Austin, Texas. Down, oh, down in Austin. Yes, sir. All right. Um, we have an affiliate here that carries your show. That, that's right. Um, uh, that's exactly right. Uh, and which one is that? KLBJ AM. Uh -huh. KLBJ, LBJ. Mm -hmm. uh, that means something. LBJ. Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, darn right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, the thicket. What do you mean by thicket? What is thicket? Is that just a high weed country or what? <laughs> no, there is a, a region. Uh, uh, what a lot of people around the country don't realize is that the eastern, about the eastern quarter of Texas is heavily forested. It is the uh, western extent of the southern mixed forest. Oh, there's no question about it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, eastern Texas in general is green and uh, pretty lush. It's you know everybody's uh, you know they they think of Texas as sort of a semi-arid the desert and, and, <laughs> right. a, and a lot of Texas is like that. Yes. But, but not the eastern part. It's a whole different area. That's yes, right. it's it's uh, it's basically like Louisiana, Mississippi, and the Deep South. Sure. Uh, as as a matter of fact, the the forested areas of East Texas are roughly equivalent to the forested areas of the, of in of the entire New England states. That's a lot of forest. Yeah, so so just to give people an idea of the scale, uh, I know when a lot of, when some people hear that there's a Bigfoot in the, uh, in Texas, they immediately think, well, how could there be a Bigfoot in Texas? Well, because you know we have a lot of suitable habitat. Now, obviously, I mean, if Bigfoot is real. Right. Then he's going to require the kind of area that you're talking about to be able to evade death or capture. Correct. Now, the big thicket is uh, what is a name that has traditionally been given to the southern end of the East Texas Piney Woods. Okay. Uh, this is roughly between uh, the Trinity River, uh, the lower Trinity River, which is just east of Houston, uh, about to the Louisiana border. Hmm. And it's a, the, the region is about 60, 70 miles wide and about the, about the same distance uh, north to south. And it encompasses the two biggest river swamp systems in, in east Texas, and, uh, and many know, bayous, marshes. I, I, I want to stop you uh, yes. for just one moment. Yes. Uh, have you been a listener to the show for a while? Yes. Do you remember a man who claimed that he killed two Bigfoot? I heard that story, but I heard that was up in the panhandle of Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh, which is more like the country you were referring to, the other kind of country of part That's of Texas. That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I won't say that there have never been any uh, sightings of Bigfoot in Texas outside of East Texas. Occasionally, you know, there uh, there have been some. And matter matter of fact, uh, I know of two organizations uh, in Texas that that chart recent sightings, uh, both of which have websites. And one of them actually reported a sighting in uh, Lago Vista, which is on Lake Travis right outside of Austin in the hill country. Mm. There, are, there is some land out there that's fairly undeveloped, owned by the local river authority. So you, you have approached this whole thing as a journalist? Yes, sir. The way, the way I got st uh, started on this art is that I grew up in a little town called Sour Lake, which is uh, population 1,600, uh, right